So we see this prefix in the English language, which is derived from ancient Latin, dis, D-I-S, and it simply means this. It, it, it means indicating reversal. So there again, dis, courage, now you have a reversal of courage. You have a reversal of, of that courage that God put within you. It also means lack of. So now there's a lack of. Wherever there's dis, there's a lack of. I know a lot of Christians, their name, it's, it's not just brother or sister. It is dis, brother and sister. Be, because, because they live in this lack of. Lack of joy, lack of hope, lack of faith, lack of peace, lack of happiness. There's lack in their life, and the reason why is because before the brother or sister, before the Mr. Miss, before the title of their name, whatever it may be, there's dis, the actual prefix before their name and their status in life, it's dis, because they see everything in lack. Shortage, 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 shortage. Lack of God's love, lack of God's grace, lack of God's mercy. When God's word alone, just look at mercy. When you got up this morning, he renewed his mercy in your life. So let me help you with this. If you sinned before you went to bed, I mean, you're laughing. I don't know about that. I I don't know how to take that. I'm not sure. I'm just going to keep moving. I won't digress. But anyway, so if you... If you sinned last night, right? I do need to keep moving on that one because <laughs> mine's going everywhere. Okay. When you woke up this morning, okay. when you woke up this morning, he just gave you a fresh delivery of mercy. <laughs> for the previous night, the previous day, and also, which is most important, for today. Somebody say, I have new mercy today. So see, that, that's why you can't have disconnected to you. You know, you need to disconnect from dis and get attached to being connected. But anyway, you can, you can live in lack of because you have a dis mentality. It also means the opposite of, as we know, I already kind of touched on. So the opposite of, anytime there's dis. You know, it's like there are a lot of Christians, they have dis faith. Not this faith, or definitely not now faith, Hebrews 11.1. 1. They have dis faith. They have opposite faith. There were times the, the apostles themselves, the disciples, which of course eventually became ordained apostles, had 11, of course, Judas... You know what happened there? And then, of course, uh, uh, replacement with him in the book of Acts. So you have the 12 original apostles. Of course, I had the apostle. Well, anyway, but the, the, the original 12, there were times when they had disfaith. Jesus, sometimes he, he rebuked them because of their lack of faith. Here, here's, here's another way to say lack of faith, disfaith. Because there again, dis means Lack of. There are a lot of Christians out there with disfaith. And God is saying you need to disconnect from the dis in your life. It means away from or absence of or deprived of. Somebody say, let's destroy dis thing. Amen. Go with me over to Joshua 1. As I said last week, I want to say it again. You are not subject to dis. You are not subject to discouragement. Amen. You are not subject to being dissuaded. You are not subject to uh, disenfranchisement. You are, not, uh, you are not subject to basically anything that has disconnected to it and, and, and the prefix dis, you are not subject to that. It has no place in your life. It cannot lord over you because there's only one lord. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ who is your Lord and your Savior and your friend and your elder brother, the Bible says. Amen. The friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Man, isn't that a, isn't that a wonderful Savior right there? So, so anyway, when you begin to understand you're not subject to this, it has no place in your life. 
So there again, lack has no place in your life. Fear has no place in your life. A reversal of fortune, reversal of good things, reversal of peace. None of that has a place in your life because that is all connected to the dis. And we are not subject to dis. Somebody say, I am. By the grace of God, not subject to dis. Then turn to somebody and say, did you get that? Now, look at this, Joshua 1.9. I read this last week, and then we're going to go a few other places. Oh, you're going to enjoy this because I really want to really bring this word out more thoroughly because it's used all throughout the Word of God, specifically in the Old Testament. God used it again and again and again and again, and we need to understand the settings when and why God used it. Look at this, Joshua chapter 1. Verse 8, I'm going to start with verse 8. This book of the law shall not, now keep in mind, first five books of the law, first five books of the Bible referring to the law. Um, I'm not going to trail off. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, then thou shalt have good success. Isn't that interesting that God says, listen, you will, you will make your way prosperous? And you will have good success. Isn't that interesting? God said, you will make your way prosperous. Oh, I thought God was going to make your way prosperous. He already has. He already has. When do you do that? Well, from the foundation of the world. Can you get more specific? Yeah, when you got born again. Can you kind of narrow that down? Yes. When you started understanding the exceeding great and precious promises that are in the word, and you started living them out. Carrying them out, understanding them, matriculating them through your spirit and your mind and walking in them. Then you begin to understand, wow, God has given me all things that pertain to life and godliness. And so you begin to realize that I make my way prosperous. Because God, there again, he's already made your way prosperous. He's, meaning he's already ordained you to prosper. It's a foundational scripture. We started this church 26 years ago. Foundational scripture. And I remember that time. I said, look, here, here's our foundational scripture, guys. And I know all, most all of you know it. You could quote it. 3 John 2. Beloved, I wish above all things. Help me out with it. I kind of forgot it. Okay. Okay. That, yeah, that was real thunderous there. But anyway, thank you for the faithful four that quoted it. I know you can all quote it. So now we're going to all quote it together. Beloved. I wish, I desire above all things that. Oh, somebody say thank you, Jesus, for that. Amen. I mean, come on. That's just, that ought to make you happy right there. So anyway, um, God has already deigned, ordained you to prosper. He wants you to do well in life. He wants you to be successful in life. We just have to line up to God's will. Simple as that. One of the ways you do that, you get into his word, you study his word, you follow his word. And, and when you do that, he says, you're, you'll make your way prosperous. You know, all, everyone in this world, even if they're non-Christians, they have a God-given gift. Now, granted, some non-Christians, they have prostituted that gift. They have tainted, polluted that gift, but they're still using that gift. Now, if they got born again and used in the kingdom of God for good, could you imagine how, how much more we could advance the kingdom of God? But regardless of that, back now to the born-again people of God. You were born with a gift. You have a gift. Tell somebody around you, I have a gift. Now tell them you have a gift. It's a God-given gift. When you, when you were formed in your mother's womb, when you were formed, the moment of conception, God placed gifts, I mean, not even plural, within your life, Right? You are gifted to do things. That's why you do things the way you can do them, and it comes natural to you. When people have asked over the decades, how do you know you're gifted at something? And I usually tell them when you don't even realize that what you do is actually special, that it's easy to you, it's natural to you, it's, 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 it's as easy as breathing, it's as easy as uh, eating, whatever it is, you know, that's just easy, almost natural, it's almost automatic. So that, that's one of the ways you know that you are gifted. Everyone has been gifted by God. Now God, you, God lets us know, listen, it's up to you. You need to, you need to hone in on that gift. You need to utilize it. You need to craft it. You need to work on it. It's up to you to make something out of it. 
It's up to you to make something out of it. Never sit around and wait for God to do it. Let me help you. He won't. The only way he'll help you is if you're moving, moving forward. That's the only way. Every person, case in point, every person that Christ called, they were doing something. Can I help you with this? They weren't sitting at home praying. They weren't sitting at home watching Christian television. Can I help you with this? They were all working. You had blue-collar entrepreneurs, and, and, and you had white-collar uh, borderline criminals. But they were at least working. It's in the Bible. But anyway, so they were at least working. They were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for the one called the Christ. They knew enough of the Old Testament that things are starting to change, and I can feel and sense something in the atmosphere because people of faith can. So anyway, people who are looking for the revelation of God can begin to see things long before they ever happen. But anyway, uh, so these men, they were all moving forward. They were at least doing something that they had been gifted to do by God. And those are the people that Jesus called. And same to this day, those are the ones that he calls, those are the ones he chooses in order to carry out his purpose in a greater dimension. So you just keep moving forward with your gift. Hone it, practice it, get the, make, make it the best you possibly can, and God, I will promise you this, God will come and do great things with what you are doing in your life than you can ever even imagine. Everybody say amen. amen. Okay, now verse 9, I digress again. Thank you for your patience. Have I not commanded you? Now God's speaking directly to Joshua again. Now he told him, he said, Joshua, listen, bottom line, you better stay in this word. You better, you better know it well because you're going to need it more than you can ever realize right now. Because I want you to prosper. I want you to, I want you to have good success in your life. Uh, I want you to have a prosperous life because when you prosper, other, others prosper. When you succeed, others succeed around you. As simple as that. There's plenty to go around. We don't, we don't, oh, no, 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 no. Let me stay focused. Verse 9, have I not commanded you? Yeah, if you're kind of new here to the style here, it's just I, I got to talk to myself because I have about 28 things going on at the same time here, and I got to filter some things out because sometimes I said, no, anyway, have not I commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Somebody say, be strong. Be strong. Good courage means be courageous. Some. You, you may have a version that reads, actually, be courageous. Somebody say, be courageous. Be courageous. Tell somebody around you, be courageous. courageous. Now tell somebody, at least look courageous. <laughs> Man, at least look courageous. Fake it till you make it. I mean, come on, you know, just, if you're not, just, be, yeah, can I help you with this? Hey, we, now, now. I've taught over the decades, you know me and him too, you know, about fear and it has torment, the Bible. I know all the scriptures about fear, but I'm going to tell you something. We've all, we've all been afraid at one time or another. If you've never been afraid of something, that means you ain't doing nothing. If you've never been afraid of anything in your life, that means you ain't doing jack squat with your life. If you've never stepped out into, and launched out into the deep, I mean, it's just simple as that. The, the only way you'll never be afraid in, in your life is to live in a bubble all the days of your life and sing kumbaya, twiddle your thumb, say, Jesus, hurry up and get me out of here. Yes. And, and life doesn't work that way, amen? You were not born in a vacuum. You were, meant, you were not meant to stay in a vacuum, right? Okay. So, so we understand that uh, courage is being afraid, but saddling up anyway, pilgrim. Uh, it, it's really that simple. Now, that, that's a line from John Wayne, the movie's Train Robbers. You might want to watch it sometime. Just don't watch it right now on your phone. But it's a great line. I mean, it'll preach. I'm preaching it right now. Because listen, listen, I mean, you know, you ever, you've seen the movie The Train Robbers? I, I'll condense it real quick. You still need to watch it. Uh, but it, bottom line is they're about to face off with the bad guys. They're outnumbered 20 to 1. I mean, you know, just insurmountable odds. And they got you know, all this stuff going on. Then plus, you know, they, they, they got a lady they got to protect. You know, they always got to throw the beautiful lady in so the ladies will watch the Westerns too. So, so you know, this was made back in the 60s. So Anne Margaret, you know, she's, she's the one they're protecting her and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And there again, they only got a few cowboys there. But at least they're real men. They knew they were men. They were cowboys. But anyway, 
So this one young cowboy, he'd never been in a real, real shootout. You know, not, I mean, just not in a real battle. So now, I mean, it, it's getting crunch time beyond crunch time because winter is coming and full blast. So, you know, he, so, so John Wayne, he's going to the few troops that he has, about the four or five guys that he has. And he gets to this one young guy and he says, how you doing, son? And anyway, and, you know, and he's trying to fake it a little bit and, and, uh, and then finally he asked the Duke, and he says, you know, aren't you afraid? He says, sure, I'm afraid. Sure, I'm afraid. But courage is being afraid and saddling up anyway. So you know the rest of the story. It gave that young cowboy some courage, and they shot the bad guys, and they won and got the gold. Didn't get the girl, though. But anyway, at least got the gold. But anyway, so sometimes you can't win them all, guys. What did I say? But anyway, so... But if you've never been afraid, you've never done anything in your life. If you've never been afraid, you've never launched out into a new venture. If you've never been afraid, it's easy to sit back and criticize when someone's launching something new in their life. I don't know about you. I love all people, but I, 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 I detest, I despise, I loathe. Let me come up with a few more adjectives. A critical spirit. I don't detest and loathe a critical person, but I detest and loathe a critical spirit. And how dare someone criticize someone who's launched out into the deep? Don't you know they're afraid? They got a little bit of fear. Now, they're acting courageous, and they have faith. At least their faith buoys and overrides the fear, but the fear is kind of still mingled in. And they're good. if you don't have a little bit of fear, then you ain't doing much bigger than what you've always done. So when you get to that point, you realize God will say, listen, I want you to be courageous. I want you to have some courage. I don't want you to be discouraged. I don't want you to have a reversal or lack of courage, especially now, because this is what will happen. I do not want you to be afraid or dismayed. Discouragement leads to greater fear. And then greater fear gives birth to being dismayed. There is this diabolical graduation from fear. Fear has levels. And, and some of the greater levels of fear, when John talks about them, they can go to torment even. The Bible even says that fear has torment. Now, not all levels of fear have torment. But you start getting into higher levels of fear that the enemy's throwing at you, it can torment you. You don't have to raise your hand or say, oh, I, I, I know I can experience it and all that. But I'm going to tell you something. There are levels of fear that you will lose sleep over. You don't want to eat. You start, if you're not careful, you let your sound mind get away from you. You will start having every kind of fearful forethought imaginable. And what, what that's leading to is that the enemy now wants to take you into the category of dismay. Because when you are dismayed, you're done. When you get dismayed, it's over. You lose hope, you lose faith, you lose your drive, you lose your will. I mean, you, you lose even seeing your purpose, let alone walking into your destiny. You know, I broke it down a little bit more even last week about dismay because the word may, the heart of that word, remember, it means a prime of. The word may means the prime of. The original Latin meaning for may is a prime of life, a prime season, prime time, if you will, we would even say today. So it means this wonderful opportunistic time that has been presented to you. So that's why God, he says it again and again and again and again and again and again. He says, I do not want you to be dismayed. I brought you into the prime of your life. Well, I thought that was when I was going to be a lot younger. The prime of your life is when God brings you to the threshold of entering into something else that's bigger. You can be 94 and come into the prime season of your life. Because those prime seasons, that's another teaching in itself, those prime seasons come throughout your life. They don't happen every day, but they do happen. That's why to everything there is a season. There's a time for everything under heaven. And then you get in the New Testament, Paul deals a lot about that very issue about 
time. Esther understood that I was brought into the kingdom for such a time as this. So, so God, the timing factor with God is he brings you into a May time of your life, this wonderful opportunity, this wonderful prime aspect of, of God presenting this wonderful, wonderful new chapter in your life. And when it's there, God said, I don't want you to be dismayed. This is your May. This is your May season. I'm prophesying that over you. I'll prophesy to myself. This is your May season. This is your May venture in life. This is your May, not May day from distress. This is your May day because it's a new day for you in your life with what God is getting ready to do and reveal and bless you in and with. Somebody say, it's May day in my life. There again, not the distress signal. We're going to change that meaning there, huh? So, because dismay it means to break down, to beat down, and shatter. See, see the graduation here? Because if the enemy gets you into a place where you are dismayed, he's beaten you down. He's broken you down, and he's shattered. He shattered your dream. He shattered your faith. He shattered your joy. He shattered your, you know, your purpose. He just shattered you. And I've met too many Christians in life, whose lives have been shattered. You know, you know, you know what ministry is, bottom line? I mean, I could, pull out, I could pull out three main scriptures that summarize ministry, especially from a pastoral perspective in that regard. You know, you know, what, you know what ministry is, bottom line? It's helping people who are shattered get put back together. Just bottom line. Just bottom line. It's helping people whose lives have been shattered, who are currently shattered, helping them get those shattered pieces back together. It's helping people who have been beaten down and broken down by life, by the system, by the man. You can go down the list, but the enemy used all of the above and about 87,000 other things to beat people down and to break them down. And God, some reason or another, he has gifted me and called me and anointed me and propelled me to help people who are broken down and beaten down and shattered and let them know that, listen, God can turn this thing around. God can put all the pieces back together. God can make you new again, young again, hope again, believe again, faith-filled again, and dream again. God can turn it around for the good. For more information about our teaching resources, visit our website at ciclive.com.